about St. Petersburg is our, uh, our, you know, our VHL team, basically our farm team and the MHL team, which is like the junior team. They, we, they all play out of St. Petersburg and, they're, and they all practice out of our, they all play and practice out of, out of our practice facility. So it, it's a, a wonderful opportunity that, you know, some player development coaches don't have, or maybe their farm team or, or guys they drafted in junior are playing uh, on different teams. So I, I, I get a great opportunity to evaluate, train and develop everybody within that Scott system because we're all in one central location which is a um, like I said very lucky to have that not you know not every team or is set up like that so very lucky in St. Petersburg to have that opportunity but you know that's basically my role there is to be with the, the KHL team full-time but also uh, train and evaluate all the other players within the Scott system. Yeah that's cool that's cool it's interesting having that perspective from being over in North America and over in Russia uh, talk a little bit about that from the coaching style differences. Are there any differences culturally? Be, be cool. Yeah, I think uh, you know I've been I've been very fortunate to, to you know I've traveled quite a bit in coaching in different countries, and I'm sure just like a lot of coaches on here that maybe have had a, a coach different kids from other countries have had somebody play for them that's from a different country. There's there's always going to be you know cultural elements from those countries that are going to affect the way they play the game or view the game. Um, and to me, that's what, you know, makes hockey so great is that there's not just one way of doing things. That's, you know, the, my biggest takeaway from, you know, uh, you know, uh, having worked in Russia, having worked in Sweden, you know, uh, having worked in Finland is you go to these, um, you know, dominant hockey countries and you, you go to Sweden, you go to Russia, you go to Canada, it's, you know, three completely different ways of doing things yet, you know, each country is still able to develop high level talent. So I think it's, a, it, it's, it, it, it to me, it's a, a sort of a wake up call that, you know, it's not one way of doing things. There's, there's multiple ways of doing it. And you can take things from different cultures and countries and uh, sort of put it all together to build a great program. Uh, but that's really my big takeaway from, from the cultural, uh, you know, evaluation of things. When you look at it from like the player development perspective, what's kind of like your take on seeing that the gaps right now, that something that maybe more coaches should understand about what's been going on in the player development role um, and how to infuse that more culturally. What's what's kind of like a main... Hey, Vinny, I'm sorry you cut out there. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, like what's like a main staple like from a player development role, right? Your perspective is unique on that end. What's something that you've picked up on that is one of those things that should be a main staple that maybe isn't common knowledge but should be common knowledge that you kind of notice uh, that you wish was out there a little bit more? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing that, to me right now with player development is the communication piece that, you know, the building the buy-in and building a rapport um, with your players. And, you know, like I said, you can you can have a, a great deal of knowledge as a coach um, and, you know, be very well versed in, in different development um, avenues. But if you can't connect with the player, if you can't build that trust with the player, if the player doesn't see value in it, you're gonna have a hard time, you know, transferring that knowledge and, and having that player apply to it. So I think that that relationship building, uh, building trust, understanding that that is a, a process in itself, uh, a long-term process in itself, an evolving process, and being able to work within that and, and putting that in the forefront, and really understanding that that to me is whatever culture you're working with, and obviously if you're working with a culture that's that's not your own and, and a little bit different, that that's gonna be. Um, uh, that that might be a challenge, but I feel that it, it's a great skill to possess as a coach. That you know, creating that buy-in, building that trust, and creating that relationship, which gives you that platform to really have effective and long-term player development. Yeah, it's interesting how much that comes up consistently now across the board. Right, everyone's and it's uh, that human connection piece. It's, uh, well, it's yeah, it, it's, I think it's definitely big, and I think you know, with with the trend we're seeing now, and you know. Like as we move from that, you know, I say you do culture to, you know, why, why, why do I have to do this? And, you know, that, that, that piece becomes ever more important. Yeah, exactly. What, what have you noticed has been like different with players today as opposed to maybe five, ten years ago? Like what, what kind of differences have you been picking up on? Yeah, I think it, I think it's, it, it ties into the, you know, the building that rapport with the player. I think players now are so hungry for information. I think they're, they're also, ex because of the digital platforms available to players and all the social media and, and the web, I think, uh, and the access to hockey, uh, players are, 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 
they have access to that sort of content and information and they're getting a ton of things thrown at them, whether it's highlights, whether it's, you know, how to do this, whether it's that. And so they have a lot more questions. They have a lot more information at their disposal. Okay. Um, and they want to know the why. And, you know, it's important that you, you know, you're able to explain that to them. But I think the biggest thing I've seen is that hunger for information. Uh, they want to know why. They want to know how it's going to help them, you know, how it's going to affect them long term. You know, why are we doing this as an individual? Why are we doing this as a team? And I think that that hunger for information and that uh, willingness to ask for information and, and to be open about it, I think is, you know, one of the biggest change I've seen. Yeah, that's awesome. So we were talking about uh, the other day we got into developing D on the offensive blue. I thought it'd be interesting to kind of get into some of that, the differences, right, of how and we'll get into the understanding. Like we had a great conversation and we'll have the podcast coming out here in the next uh, in the next week or so. Uh, what was interesting about that conversation was talking about conceptually, how much more that it's not just the system based and getting around the concepts and a lot. And things is including more the D into the play. So do you happen to have um, any thoughts on that part of uh, getting into that? Yeah, so I, I, I prepped a, a video for all the coaches, you know, aside from the, uh, the great combo we're having, I wanted to, you know, to provide all the, the coaches and people who took time out of their day some, um, just give them a little bit of insight as to how I go about, you know, developing defense and on the offensive blue line and, and the process I use um, and the steps I take and sort of all the details within that. Um, and uh, so I'll be showing a, a bunch of video and stuff. If anybody... Um, what I'll do is uh, I'll put my uh, number up and uh, if anybody wants any of the videos on here or they have some more detailed questions as to how it relates to the age group and level that they're coaching, I'm happy to take any phone calls privately thereafter and uh, have a discussion about it. Uh, but like I said, I wanted to uh, you know, show something meaningful and, and, and provide some takeaways for, for all the coaches that are with us today. Beautiful. Beautiful. So I'll uh, so I'll pop up and get into the presentation if, if that's okay with you, Vinny. Absolutely. And so I'm just going to share my screen, and, and I guess maybe you can you can check with everybody to make sure that they can see my screen. Yep. Pause so does everybody can everybody see the screen? Yep. Oh, okay. Okay, great. So again, I just want to, uh, you know, welcome everybody and thank everybody for uh, for tuning in. Um, I'm just going to exactly dig in a little bit deep as to, uh, again, how I uh, worked with defensemen, both in SCA and within the national program. Um, as I mentioned, that was one of the big things that uh, we, we identified as a development gap in the national program and, and um, you know, we put a plan together to start working with the D. I just want to sort of go through all that with you guys. So uh, the first thing I want to show is something that, you know, you, you see a lot of these long-term player development models and almost every national organization, you know, whether it's uh, Hockey Russia, USA Hockey, Hockey Canada, uh, the Swedes, the Finns, everybody has something that, that looks like this, you know, athlete skill development from when the kids are young, you know, 60, 80%, you know, then you get into hockey concepts and you get into position skill and principles and team tactics. But for a lot of coaches, especially coaches that just get into coaching or are working with a young um, uh, group, you know, this sometimes is a little bit too vague. And, you know, you know, what do you do within the skill development uh, process? And what do you do within the hockey concepts? And are those blended or, or do you finish with the skill development and then move on to the hockey concepts? And so I feel that with this chart, there could be a lot of, unanswered questions and, and um, um, yeah, basically just a lot of unanswered questions that uh, don't really lead you to uh, a proper development path. So for you guys, I really wanted to dig deep and, and bring you into sort of how I work, you know, with, with keeping this in mind. And I guess the, the biggest thing for me before I start is really how I approach uh, the player development process. And to me, that's that's four key things. That's the, the technical aspect, which is um, you know, basically their, their core skills. So if I'm speaking specifically about uh, defensemen and how they work on the offensive blue line, you know, we want to make sure that their skating is up to par and obviously that they have a variety of different skating patterns that they could utilize on the offensive blue line. You know, then you want to make sure that the tactical application is there. They understand how to take those technical elements and use them in a tactical way. 
Then you have the cognitive piece, which is, uh, you know, another, you can basically put that under, um, you know, hockey IQ. To me, that that piece is really the, you know, how I, I uh, that cognitive piece is really that visual and cognitive processing piece. So can that, can that defenseman on the offensive blue line process what's in front of him and output a proper response to deal with that situation? And I'll, we'll talk about how I use video to help defensemen better um, better identify those things and output a better response. And physical uh, is not something that I, I work on. We have a, a staff that does that, but it is something if, if you're if you're focused on multidisciplinary development, it's something that you want to pay attention to. So, for example, if you're working with you know eight nine year olds and you're you know you want to start working on skating patterns on the offensive blue line, if some kids can't properly squat or they have just simple movement issues and aren't uh, don't have that athletic base that might affect their ability to learn those technical skills. So even at a young age, this physical part doesn't necessarily mean being big and strong. It means at a younger age, it can mean, um, you know, just having basic athletic movement and being proficient in those movements so that you can build a good hockey player. And that's, you know, Hockey Canada and USA Hockey, they talk about that a lot about making sure that, you know, the kids are well-rounded athletes and we have a good athlete to build that sport-specific hockey player on top of and these are really the four things that i uh uh i look at when i'm developing a player and make sure that we're, we're checking off all these uh boxes so now i'm going to start i'm going to show you guys sort of how i move through these things how i go from technical to tactical to cognitive and how i might blend them when i'm developing uh, those skills on the offensive blue line for the deep So the first thing I start with um, when I'm working with defensemen on the offensive blue line is I want to get all the skating patterns down. So um, I want the, the D to work on all the different variations that they could utilize to walk the offensive blue line. Now, you, at, at this point, you don't have to add any technical talk. We don't have to have any discussion as to why we're doing what we're doing. We simply want to establish good technical skating um, uh, on the offensive blue line. Uh, not just in what, not just in maybe a backwards shuffle or backwards crossovers, but in, in a multitude of different skating patterns. The, the more proficient they are in, in various skating patterns, okay, the harder they are to get, the harder they are going to be to play against. The more tools they're going to have at their disposal, okay, and the more things uh, they're going to be able to do to, to be effective on the offensive blue line. So I start nice and simple, and like I said, um, here's a clip of uh, of Lucas one of D men. And just nice and simple, we're, all we're doing here is just working on our crossovers coming across. And so that's an example of just working on the technical piece. I'm not focused on anything else here. I'm just, we're working on his crossovers, nice big steps, making sure he's going in one direction and just simply focusing on that technical element. Here's another example of, of hip rotations. So he's coming across the blue line and rotating his toes from one board to another. Um, you know, another obviously a very effective way to, to work across the blue line depending on the situation. But again, just focusing on the skating component and the technical aspect for the player. And with this one, if you have a group of young kids, you don't have to add a puck. Um, you know, you can just, you know, simply focus on the uh, skating component. If your kids are really young, you know, seven, eight, nine years old, you don't even have to apply uh, uh, an in-game context to it. You can simply just use this as a skating drill and do different skating patterns for the defense without even talking about the offensive blue line. That in itself is, is helping build that foundation for the future. So here he's working on sprinting. So one step and then sprinting to the, uh, let me back that up so you guys see that again. So here's a different one where we cross and sprint. Okay. And just for the coaches out there, I have about 25 different variations for you guys. So um, after we're done the call, like I said, I'll put my number up. And if you guys want all the different uh, skating variations I do with the defensemen, um, I'll, I'm happy to share those with you. Here's a clip of uh, me working with the, U18 girls national team and this was the first session I ever did with them on this stop so if you notice on this one this is basically how I would start even with a group of eight-year-olds so these are U18 national team girls 
but I would start the same way with a group of seven, eight year olds. And here uh, we're simply just focused on the skating patterns, lots of reps. So here they're working on the backward shuffle. Um, next one will be crossovers. And I'm just getting a ton of reps here, working on that technical piece. Okay, making sure they have good habits with the upper body, lower body. Okay, and they're just getting a lot of reps. In, and and uh, it's like I said before, this is just, they're getting those reps in on the technical piece with the lower body. And this is something you could do, again, with pros, with, with little kids. This is applicable all the way down, all the way up. And especially a lot of pros that aren't used to it. Usually a lot of the pro guys that have difficulty got problems with their hips. So that really affects the mobility. So doing even a lot of these exercises for those guys, a lot of the guys in SCA that were, were, didn't use their hips well on the offensive blue line, you know, towards the middle of the season, they all, you know, they all were coming to us, you know, 15 minutes before practice, let's, let's do some skating on the offensive blue line because it, it, they felt it really helped them uh, progress, you know, into the practice. The other thing that's just as important is when you're working on these skating patterns, um, I was talking about the lower body a lot, but at the same time, you do not want to forget about the upper body. And you want to make sure that when they're doing these skating patterns, even if they don't have a puck, they're, they have a good upper body posture, which means, give me one second here, guys, as they're coming across the blue line, they got their head up. And so even while you're, even while you're working on those skating patterns and they have a puck or they don't have a puck or there's a game application or no game application, you want to start building those habits. Um, and making sure that he's got his head up, he's underhandling the puck, he's got a stick in a functional position so he can move it here, he can move it there, and making sure that when you when you transitioning from that technical phase to the tactical phase, you haven't left any development hurdles in the way. So if you just focus on that skating piece and you you know the kid's got to stick up and down the ice and he's he's got his head down, that's going to affect your ability to transition from technical development to tactical development. So you want to build all those good habits while you're working on all those technical pieces. So head up, stick in functional position. Once he gets comfortable with that, you can progress. So you can start with, so for example, if I wanted to do progressions and I was working on the skating, but I also wanted to make sure that I was building those good habits with the upper body, I might start, so let's just say I was doing crossovers. So the first drill might just be crossovers without a puck to the middle. Second drill would be crossovers uh, with a puck to the middle. Third drill would be crossovers with a puck to the middle shot. The fourth drill would be crossovers to the middle, having your head up, shot. The fourth drill might be crossovers to the middle, head up, pass to the flank. Uh, the, and then you want to get more advanced. So what I might do is I might want him not just having his head up, but I want him having his head up scanning information. So I might move across the blue line in front of the defenseman, and I might be giving him different cues. Like I might put my hand up and give him a two or give him a four, or give him a, and I'm going to ask him to read those out to me. So I'm having I'm having him identify and read back to me visual cues, which are going to be extremely important um, once we transfer into the tactical uh, piece. And like I said, building those uh, good habits are going to allow uh, defensemen to make good reads like this and make good plays to identify they have a. Uh, a man advantage in front of the net and, and place that puck in the right area. Um, the decision-making piece, again, you know, making sure that they have their head up. If they don't have their head up and they can't process information, they can't output a good decision. So you could end up in a situation where you have a, a, a kid or a player that moves beautifully across the offensive blue line, but he doesn't have those habits that allow him to process information. And that's that to me is, is the really important piece. And again, same here on this video, Wierenski gets the puck. Uh, he's not looking to shoot to score. He's look, he, he, he understands that there's bodies and numbers in front of the net. There's guys almost in the shooting lane, and he's making a smart decision by being able to process that information in front of him. And again, he's able to process that information in front of him because he's built that habit of having his head up and processing and being able to identify those visual cues in front of him.
So here's a sample uh, lesson plan for you guys uh, that I would utilize, um, you know, with defensemen to establish good technique on the offensive blue line. So in this first uh, part here, So this first part here, I'll do a simple hip warm up, and I've got a video I'll show you guys what I'm talking about. Just warm up the hips and a little bit of skating just to get the guys going. In the uh, second part here, that's where I'll, we'll divide up the D into four corners, have them going from uh, opposite sides, and then this way we're able to get a ton of reps in, um, working on all the different skating patterns, and again with with a focus on good upper body habits as well. And then we finish off with some agile skating to get the intensity up. Um, like I said, I have this, uh, this plan and a bunch of other plans for you guys, so I'm happy to share those with you. And here's uh, this, I think, I believe this is a video of that specific lesson plan or part of it. So here's the, these would be under 20 national. So these are world junior guys for the national team. So this is just a hip warm up for the D. So we warm up with a hip warm up. And then we get into divide the guys up into four corners and, and, and start working on all those different patterns. And what we would do too is uh, before each pattern, especially with the older guys, we, we obviously do a demonstration. And, you know, we talk about the tactical piece as well, which I'll get into. But obviously with this level of player in this age, it's a lot more in depth. Uh, but even with little guys, if you, you know, before you go into each one, you sort of want to bring them in. You want to go over all the things that you'd like to see as a coach in the skating patterns. And again, you always want to emphasize those good upper body habits with the head up, stick in a functional position. And so we just have the D going and they're going out of all four corners and they're just working on all those uh, different uh, skills across the blue line skating habits. And so they're getting a ton of reps, and we do this for about an hour, just getting all those reps in on all those different uh, um, skating patterns. Here's one before the uh, World Championship um, with the uh, men's team. So um, if we go back, I'm just going to go back for you guys. So if you uh, don't have the luxury of splitting ice and you don't have, if you can't have the ice all with the defenseman, like I have here, and you need to incorporate forwards. That la that's why I put in that last video for you guys. You can set up your. Give me one sec, here, guys. You can set up forwards in you know each corner over here, and have them do you know whether they're coming out of the corner and attacking the net or coming up the wall and then attacking or hitting the D and getting a pass back. You can involve them in. Uh, offensive blue line patterns and have them play and then maybe you want you know some got some forwards in the middle maybe working on face-offs but there's ways of get, uh, being able to run this practice for the D while uh, making sure that the forwards are involved if you don't have the luxury of splitting up your um, uh, your practices between forwards and D like a lot of minor hockey teams won't um, or and even with the minor hockey teams, if you want to take all the D on one set of forwards you could do that uh, but at least that gives you guys some ideas and then here's a little example of that um, last example I gave you, just getting the forwards involved on those offensive blue line drills. And I got a, I got a lot of examples of those type of drills where uh, out of all four corners with two forwards uh, low and the 2D up. So if you guys need any of those, I'm happy to provide you with a ton of examples. So like I said, here's one before the, the uh, World Championship with the men's team. So we had, uh, you know, Kuzi working out of the corner, doing different puck protection drills. Um, and then we had the D. Uh, yeah, you could pass the corner. Then we had the Ds coming across the blue line. And that's uh, Zaitsev, I believe. Yeah, so he's just working on different patterns coming across the blue line with a net front presence. And then putting a little bit of pressure on him. So that's another way. If you don't have that luxury, you can get the forwards involved. And uh, you can work on all sorts of different patterns as well. Okay, so um, 
once we establish that, you know, good uh, technique, um, you know, how do we how do we get those players to uh, a level of comfort and a level of confidence where they feel they feel good about utilizing these things in game? And then, you know, once they start utilizing, you know, these things in game, how do we get them confident and um, uh, at a high level? So that's what I'm going to go through now on this uh, tactical development. And which is the next stage in the process. So the first thing that I'm going to do when I start working on the tactical stuff is I'm, I'm going to start uh, now focusing on the upper body. And when I focus on the upper body, I'm going to start applying um, uh, some false information um, or deception, whatever you want to call it. And so now I'm going to um, stack that uh, upper body deception and false information on top of that awesome lower body technical skill I just developed. Okay, so we've developed that great lower body technical skill and those good upper body habits, head up, stick in functional position, so on and so forth. Now we're going to add a tactical component to the upper body in that false information deception piece. So in this first clip, we're going to see Lucas and he's just going to be working on front lunges, so fake passes to the walls. This, and so he's working on a lower body hip rotation with an upper body fake pass or fake lunge. So now he's working on building in that deception, making this movement much more game specific. So here's one example of some false information we're going to build in with the lower body movement. Here's another example of some false information. I believe this one's a, a fake shot here. So he's going to cross to the middle, fake shot, pull the puck and create separation. Cross to the middle, fake shot, or sorry, shot. So again, um, building in upper body deception onto lower body footwork. So there we had, you know, crossovers with a fake slap shot. The previous one, we had hip rotation with fake passes. Here we're going to have uh, fake information. We're going to have a look off. So you're going to see Artyom here, um, who actually just signed with Ottawa. He's going to grab the puck, he's going to go to the middle, he's going to look off the half wall, so he's going to get false information as if he's looking off, evaluating his half wall option, and then he's going to turn his head again and, and open up for the shot. So if you see here, he's, he's, uh, I'm just going to sorry, go back and play that one for you guys again. He's going to look off his partner, he's going to look off the half wall, and then he's going to shoot. Look off his partner, look off the half wall, and then right into the shot. i just get that one for you guys one more time. So again here, look off his partner, look off the half wall, and then right into a shot. Here we're going to have, uh, so in the first one you saw uh, fake pass with the hip rotation. Now you're going to see fake slap shot with the hip rotation. So now, now that you guys see, like once we build that lower body foundation with all the different skating elements, and you start to add all the different um, variations of false information with the upper body, you really start to have so many different options of how you can manipulate play on the offensive blue line. And that's really what we want to do here with the guys. We want to establish that good technical base and also sort of broaden their horizons and understanding of everything that's capable on that offensive blue line and really sort of help spark their imagination. Okay, so once we get that technical proficiency with the lower body and we have that nice technical efficiency with the upper body in terms of false information, underhandling, so on and so forth. Um, we then want to, one second here guys. So what we do now is we sort of go back a little bit. And once we have that skill set, um, I go back and I start talking to the D um, about those skating techniques that we worked on before and how they apply to in-game situations. So we start discussing and talking about these the, uh, the uh, pros and cons of each uh, variation of skating as it relates to the situation of the game. So for example, if I'm on the power play, you know, I may want to utilize a hip rotation because it's very hard for that forward who's checking me to understand if I'm going to shoot or if I'm going to pass. Every time I rotate my hips, he has to make an adjustment with his feet. He has to make an adjustment with his stick. If 
If I have inside position on a D, you know, I may want to cross over. I may want to, you know, cross and sprint. So we want to really go over and evaluate all the pros and cons and, and all the situations that we could utilize all these patterns in. And, you know, we're going to sort of, I'm going to give you guys some examples of some of the video I would actually do with the player to, you know, bridge that gap. Now that they have that good technical ability, we want them to start using them in a the game. And, but we don't want them to just start using them in a the game out of nowhere. We want them to use, utilize them in a the game by them processing information in real time and applying the proper technique to utilize for that specific situation. So in this specific exercise um, that we're going to see here, so this is another way to come across. So he's crossing and then he's catching on his inside edge and coming back to the wall for a shot. So, give me one second here. so this is a video that, you know, I would be going over with our guys and, and sort of discussing as to why the defenseman did what he did. So, sorry about that, guys. Went back a little bit. The defenseman here, uh, New York defenseman, give me a second, I'm just gonna highlight him for you so I'm on the same page. So this defenseman got the puck, he was on the, the guy on the winger here was coming up with speed and he initially looked to me like he was getting to cross over and he was gonna drive hard to get to the middle of the ice here. And he made an adjustment based on the position of this forward. So he's got his head up and he's able to process information. And to me, the piece of information that he, sorry, can everybody still see there? So right here, when he decides to stop, to me, there's a, a very important piece of information that this defenseman has processed to make that decision. This defenseman didn't just decide to stop and come back against the wall um, for no reason, especially when you consider all the amount of empty space he has over here. You know, why did he make that decision to cut back and go against the forward? So, you know, when we talk to our D, we talk about who are you reading off of? And obviously, you're going to read off your check, the guy that's pressuring you. And when you're reading off that check, there's a lot of things that you have to consider. So which way they shoot, um, what's the distance between you and that defensive player, you know, what is their stick position, you know, where is their head facing, where are their feet facing. So if we process that information, um, this forward got stuck on the wall and the defenseman came off the wall quick with crossover. So he ended up having to turn his toe caps and – recovered to the middle fairly quickly and you see his stick now coming towards the middle and that momentum is completely going towards the middle. So this defenseman picks up on that and he identifies if he can catch that inside edge and cut back, it's going to force this forward into an adjustment. The forward cannot continue um, the way he's going and defend properly. He's going to have to stop and make an adjustment to defend properly. And that adjustment is going to create the time and space needed to get the shooting lane to the net. So being by by the defenseman being able to identify the uh, bad stick and body position of this uh, forward, he's able to make an adjustment in what he's doing on the offensive blue line tactically to get that shot on net. So he's here, he processes that information, he makes the right decision, and that allows him um, that allows him to get that puck to the net and as you see here that 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 forward's gone now and he's got a ton of time and space to make a play and get the puck to the net here's just another view of that technical piece but this is another one we work on a lot get it especially uh, you know for the guys coaching junior and, and pro level obviously you know teams defend so well and those guys are, are, are out to you fast so this is a great one to make an adjustment. You want to go to the middle, cut back, and, and get that get that shooting lane, get that puck quick on net. But really, what we're we're focusing here now with the players is making the read off that that the the defensive player who's checking you. That's really what we're 
we're, we're working with the DR once we get to this phase. So here's another one on the spinorama. Oops. So here's uh, the spinorama, and this is one we work on a lot too. And we do this one to break pressure anytime the forward cheats towards the pass or comes up. So this is some a situation your defenseman might see um, when a guy tries to get that pot chest to cut off the pass or something you'll see on a PK as well, where that forward is going to come up. Yeah, it's like here, guys. So this forward's cheating, and he's he's coming up here, which is going to get him out of that shooting and passing lane. And this D is going to identify that the forward has come up through the middle, and he's got this nice big pocket of empty space back here that he can attack by spinning off. And to some people, it might look like a risky move, but what I, I really like about this escape move is he's got his body between him and the player at all times. When he gets that puck, he's got that stick of puck on the outside. That, that forward is driving. He's got to fight through body position to get to that puck. And when he spins off, he, he maintains that stick and puck away from that player. And so he makes a good the defenseman here, makes a great read, and he's able to hurt this forward by making a good read on, on the defensive player. This one's a little bit more risky, I find, just because the forward doesn't attack from that angle and probably will give some of you guys a heart attack if he does this. But to me, the forward's toe caps are straight. He's got a stick and he's able to defend right or left. But maybe this forward or, or defense has been picked up that his knee bend is not that good. So that's another, uh, you know, another important thing is uh, posture of the of the player. Right? That's another big thing we talked to about the if the if that uh, defensive uh, if that winger is um, doesn't have good posture if he's being lazy if he's not in a good hockey stance that's always going to buy you more time and it's going to force an adjustment off movement. So if he's up straight like this guy is and you get moving, he's got to get low and then start to move. So anytime you force an adjustment in posture or change in direction. It's always going to buy time and space for that defenseman. And here's another one similar to the first one where the forward comes up and here he's in the shooting lane, but slowly right there he changes. He, he, he gets out of the shooting lane. He goes to take away the pass to the D. The defenseman reads that and he's able to spin off and get to that open space and create the time and space. So again, you know, these are the sort of type of video we do with the defenseman to get them to think about the reads and what are those visual cues that they should be looking for um, in order to output the proper response. So another example, uh, another one we work on a lot is uh, similar to the uh, another skating pattern that we work on a lot. Uh, like I said, I got a bunch of them for you guys, so I'm happy to share those videos. Uh, but feet uh, feet outside the blue line on the crossovers. So as you see here, he's crossing to the uh, middle with his feet outside. And again, you know, what's the what's the tactical application for that? It's important that the players understand. So once you develop, you know, once they feel confident crossing over with a puck and they have that strong technical element, now you want to make sure that they understand what that uh, tactical piece is. So what's the tactical piece of coming across the blue line with your feet outside? Is It's going to give you more time and space to make a play. It's going to open up passing lanes that otherwise wouldn't be there if this defenseman had stayed inside and he might have been here as opposed to where he is right now. And it would be much harder to make those plays with this guy on him. Okay, so... And then we look at, you know, we might not look at, you know, just one situation. We're going to look at different situations where these sort of skills apply. So here's another situation where we have the weak side defenseman who is actually going to step outside the blue line before he gets the puck. So when he does get the puck, he's got a ton of uh, time and space to make a play. So this defenseman here, before he got the puck, has decided to 
step outside the zone to create time and space from the Nashville guy. And now he's got this huge pocket of space to, to go and make a play that he otherwise, again, would not have if he stayed there. So just going through the D uh, uh, and, and making sure, giving them real life examples of, you know, situations that they could utilize this stuff on. And, you know, what that's really going to help to do, do is, again, it's going to help them understand where they can utilize all these awesome skills that you've just helped them achieve. And it's really going to help bring up their hockey IQ. It's going to really help with their situational awareness. And again, it's, that's what's really going to help bridge the gap between, you know, great in practice to, you know, in-game utilization, you know. And that's, again, really what we're, we're, we're looking to build. So, again, providing different scenarios like this. Here's another one on uh, Carlson. Uh, and they got this is a six-on-four situation. So, obviously, uh, it's a lot more crowded. Um, so he's going to make a pass and they're going to do a high, uh, high cycle here. Oh, where did that come from? Oh, sorry guys. That video cut out a little bit, but, uh, anyway, what ends up happening here is on the six on five, sorry, six on five, obviously not as much room. So Carlson is going to use, he's going to come, uh, keep his feet outside as this guy comes across and does a pick and he ends up being able to hit this guy to actually score on this play. So, you know, that's some of the video stuff I do with the guys. Once they have that good technical piece, we start to do a lot of video like this. And, uh, you know, these are three examples. So, so I just showed you guys three examples of, you know, tactical usage of that, you know, of coming across the blue line with your feet outside the blue line or placing your feet outside the blue line when you receive a pass. Now, all of a sudden the player has that technical ability but they also have that context of how to apply this stuff in the game and what are some situations that they're going to benefit from from implementing this stuff in game. And then what we do is once we do that stuff with video, we go on the ice and we practice. And so, for example, uh, you know, like we talked about on the, like we talked about on the um, spinorama, you know. We're going we're gonna to create those same scenarios for these guys in practice. So in this situation, he's getting a D to D pass and we're just having the coach come up and take an angle up, taking away the D to D. And we, and we just ask the D to make sure he's, he looks at us, he looks at his guy and then he performs what we're asking to perform and he's, he turns off. So we replicate those situations in practice after we do the video and it's all predetermined. There's actually no thought process. He knows he's getting the pass. He knows where the pressure's coming from. And now that allows him to get those reps in with those in-game situations by applying some light, predetermined pressure. And now he's got that technical skill. He's got that in-game awareness of when to utilize it. And now we're getting those reps in in practice with those in-game situations. But again, not. it's all predetermined. He doesn't have to guess. He doesn't have to really process anything. He's just working on that with some light pressure. So that's the next step in the equation, right? So just getting a lot of reps on all those, uh, you know, in game there. And then, so these, these, this, these are the U um, twenty D uh, before the uh, World Juniors, and so this is sort of the last step in the development process. And this is where uh, there's no predetermined anything. You know, we're giving the D the puck in motion and we're sending somebody at him and the defensive player can do whatever they want, attack from whatever angle they want, uh, attack a shooting lane, attack a passing lane, be more passive, be more aggressive, you know, and, and we're asking the defense now to uh, be able to read what's in front of him and output the proper response. Um, so here's some examples. So he opens an open hip to create a shooting lane. So here, for example, he gets, he opens up and that gets the, like we talked about, he, by opening up here. So he went from a backwards position to a forward sprint position and that gets this guy to start cheating. And like we talked about before, whenever he starts cheating like that, 
It's going to present a wonderful opportunity to cut back on this guy and force him to make an adjustment. So again, here he reads foot position, not good. And he's able to spin off, protect the puck and take advantage of that. And again, uh, you just want to, you want to give them a lot of reps. You want to give them a chance to fail. Um, again, some of these are not perfect, right? But you want these guys to go through it and you want to have discussions with them thereafter. So we film all these sessions and then we can, um, you know, what I do with these guys. So this sort of practice, I would film all these sessions and then I would sit down with the D and we would talk about, you know, why this was the right choice, why this was the wrong choice. And slowly, slowly, you start to build that confidence. Um, another big peak, you know, you know, outside of this is, you know, let's say we get the D to a position where they're awesome technically. We get them to a position where they understand the technical component, where they built in that upper body, the false information. We, they, they have the confidence. Um, and they're ready to start using it in game. And this is whether it's kids or whether it's professionals, that ability to transfer is, is, is going to be really dependent on, um, you know, the coaching style. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, to, to get, um, um, I'm a firm believer that to get results from the fans, they got to make mistakes. They got to make mistakes on the offensive blue line. It's, it's 100% part of the process. Um, and, um, what I, what I would say is that, um, those, those situations